We have any questions? We have any questions? If not, let's go into our lesson. Let's read together. The public preaching of the gospel was under grave by personal weaknesses as evidence in Acts 2. When you read in Acts 2, you see that the, uh, the, the preaching of the gospel, the public preaching of the gospel as they did on the day of Pentecost, that was undergirded by, that was the only thing taking place, that was undergirded by personal witnesses. Peter, the preacher, but the, uh, every believer was out in the audience. Every believer was out in the, uh, in the community sharing the gospel himself. So the public preaching of the gospel must be undergirded by you preaching and teaching, uh, sharing the word of God. I told you that the uh, Acts and they were scattered about four chapters, first word, all except the apostle, and the fourth word, they were scattered about and they that were scattered about, they, you, that were scattered about, went about preaching, carry joy, preaching the proclamation of the gospel, sharing the gospel. That's what that, that word means. They went about sharing the good news, evangelium, uh, uh, evangelism, uh, evangelium, you, e u e v, means good. They are new. So the, what it says, what it says, preaching, it says that they went about sharing the good news. They went about sharing the good news. Philip, when he joined the, the, uh, the unit in that chariot, they said, Philip began at the same scripture and preaching to him Jesus. The translation is that Philip shared the good news. And so then we talk about preaching, preaching is sharing the good news. All y'all are preachers in that sense. Not, not the professional preacher, uh, professional as a professional, whatever, but preaching, preaching, uh, sharing what? The good news. That's what we all are called to do. In this day and time, and long before our arrival on planet Earth, that was a um, a deviation in terms of understanding and in terms of the practice of the early church. That was a deviation so that no longer, uh, for a while, no longer have the church uh, uh, and focus on sharing the good news on the outside. The church has been focused on maintaining the institution on the inside. Do you understand? Maintaining the institution. We are to promote, to go into all the world. This is what he always say. Go into all the world and preach, share the gospel with every creature. And so then, uh, we took, we, I'm not going to run ahead of myself. So we talk about, the Bible does not talk about the gift of evangelism. The Bible speaks when Quote the spirit given gift. The Bible speaks of the gift of even the gift of an evangelist, but it doesn't speak of the gift of evangelism because all of us are supposed to be evangelists. Now there are those that some say, now those who can preach the gospel better than others. Now those who share the gospel better than others. That still does not eliminate the fact that we are to groom ourselves, we, we are to uh, say practice. We have to familiarize ourselves with scripture so that when a lost person is in our midst, when a lost church member is in our midst, we can share the gospel, the saving gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the main thing I want you to know that every one of us, every one of you, are supposed to be preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel which means proclaiming the gospel, or mean, that word also means sharing the gospel. And so
so, but what had happened, the sharing of the gospel, evangelization, has been left to the professional clergyman so that Rev had to preach and get but that's not the way it was in the early church. That's not, what, not the way God has intended for it to be. He intended for every believer to go wherever you go, share the gospel, share the good news, talk about Jesus. Well, that, again, that's because uh, down through the centuries, down through the years, the church deviated from God's original intent from the Great Commission when he said go into all the world. He was telling them to all believe and, and preach the gospel. But we segmentized that. And, and, and so then it become call to preach become something that, that is different from uh, uh, sharing the gospel which is evangelism. Uh, evangelism. It's, it's, we made a difference where there is no difference. Somewhere in the lesson, and that can see a difference between, different, differentiate between our gift and, and, and uh, between our gift and our duty. Yeah, so sometimes I, we, we say, it's my gift to do this. It's not the, the gift of the an individual is the duty of every creature. So what we tied up with is gift and duty. Now naturally, it caused to create some problem because for, 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 for 20, all our lives, we've been understanding it in this way. It was the church, as it deviated from what God said, created this type of situation so that we separated preaching from evangelism or separated preaching from, from, from uh, the duty of sharing the, uh, the gospel. Every Christian is to be a sharer, uh, a proclaimer of the what of the word of uh, of, of God. Okay, so uh, so the public preaching, the public preaching of the gospel, was undergirded by personal witness. Folk was out in the nook and the corners. Folk was out in the communities sharing Jesus. They were saying the same thing. The preacher, uh, uh, the the, the uh, the, 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 uh, the public preacher was saying, well, no different. Or you don't say anything different than what I'm saying in regards to uh, God and his intentions for the church? Or you should carry a different message than me? I'm telling you what the law, that Christ Jesus died for that sin and need to repent and they need to accept Christ as their personal Savior. Us coming into a right relationship with God with a blessed hope for eternity. That's what I'm preaching. And any other Christian supposed to preach anything different? No, it's the same thing. You preach it. Yeah. Share the gospel with others. 
And as you share the gospel with others, now those who accept the gospel, there's some in your family, there's some in your community, whatever it is, then you can do one-on-one -on -one evangelism. Of course, I'm sorry, not evangelism, once they accept Christ, you can do one-on-one -on -one discipleship. So you ought to, there should not, it shouldn't be that the only time folks hear about the verities, the truths, uh, 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 the essentials of the gospel when they come to church on Sunday. I only have 40 minutes to give it to them. We ought to be hearing it every day. As we grow in Christ, we ought to be sharing with others and help them to grow in Christ. And then we come together in fellowship so that we can contribute to each other's growth. Yeah. Christians ought to talk every day. You ought to have at least one friend so that you can grow together in Christ. Yeah. So, 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 Pastor, what you're saying then is that preaching, the method of preaching is a developmental thing. Mm -hmm. That, uh, it's like, for an example, when I first came to Antioch, if you would have been preaching by go out and, 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 and evangelize somebody, I don't bet you under eye. I couldn't evangelize somebody when I needed to be evangelized. Mm -hmm. So you have to first, you have to first of all, get me somewhere to a point mm -hmm. where I can feel comfortable or uh, knowledgeable enough to go out and, and, and address the issue of salvation to anybody. Mm -hmm. Because even though I have been saved, mm -hmm. I have not eternalized mm -hmm. that process mm -hmm. until I really got into the Word mm -hmm. and then I understood mm -hmm. precisely what had happened back there years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, That's exactly so. Because it's like that. this is what the church has been lacking. This is what we all have been like, but thank God in these days that those who understand now the importance of teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we play, the church plays emphasis on preaching. Mm -hmm. Oh, he can preach. He can preach. But he did place emphasis on learning anything himself. As long as Rep knew, as long as Rep was hot, as long as Rep was theologically sound, and uh, as long as Rep had uh, some deep knowledge of the scripture, people were satisfied. But, but, but what, what the Bible is saying and what the, 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 uh, the apostles were saying is not enough for wrath to know. But you have to do all that you can to know as much as you can so that you can share it with people who might well will never see. It's not just the exclusive responsibility of the professional clergy to share the gospel. If that were the case, not too many people would ever be lost. Think about it. A simple illustration would be uh, uh, if we were to uh, go to the fellowship hall and clean the fellowship hall up. Okay, well, the fellowship hall needs cleaning. Go clean it because you're the leader. I go back there and knock out wait five, six hours, right? And I get some things done. But suppose all of us go. How much more can be done? How quickly it can be done? And that's all what, what, what it is about right, right, right now. And as I, as I grow and learn, this is what I'm trying to share with you. It's not that, again, I'm just saying well, because narrow-mindedness and escapism would have you to say, well, if that's the case, I guess, uh, or what, we've been doing it all wrong? No, that's narrow-mindedness and escapism. What we're saying is that the words you use, process and progress. We have progressed to this point. We have progressed in the book. And you are here tonight because you know, you know in your heart now that it's more than coming to Sunday, coming to church on Sunday. That's why you come on Wednesday. And that's why you come to a Bible class. You're not going to hear the four hour slang, Bible slang. You're not going to hear the preacher preaching this traditional way. But why were you here? Because of the fact that you recognize now that you have to engage your mind and your intellect in Christianity, not just your emotions. So it's about progress, it's about process, it's about movement. Go into all the world. I showed y'all the other night where uh, in five different instances the Holy Spirit said, go, go, go. It's about movement. It's about going. That's what this Christian, y'all got it? I said, you, you, and I know it's sometimes it, 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 might, it might be a little awkward for you because you, you haven't been doing it in this way too much. Amen. And if you didn't do it, you do it with your brothers. Ones who you didn't work 
about a tongue, one that you had no fear would uh, 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 embarrass you or tell you all or uh, hurt your feelings. Yeah, but the person who you felt that and restrained you, whatever it is, I don't know if I want to tell him about this. But he tells us to go. And then if Christianity shut it, that can't stand a little bit of embarrassment, it must pretend he didn't. But as you learn, as I learn, I bring it to you and I give it to you. Amen. So that we can now take our focus off of one person or so, the pulpit, and put our focus on one person who is on the throne and say, what will thou have me to do? I will have you to go out and witness, evangelize. Got it? Okay, so, and here it is. So we, much of going to be answered in this particular section here. So that the, 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 uh, the disciples, the uh, believers, every believer went out and shared the gospel. The core message believers shared. What was the core message that they shared? Listen, listen, listen. What is the core message that they share? What is the core message of Christianity? What is the very basic message, the essential? What is the, what we call the gospel in a, in a nutshell? Uh, John 3.16, that's the gospel in a nutshell. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed in him should not perish. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Amen, amen. And to support that, you can't strengthen it. That's the as you can ever get it. But uh, also you can uh, throw in Romans 5 and 8. God commended, demonstrated his love toward us. Why the, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. So he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, evangelium, good news, Saxon, glad story, glad story. So the gospel is good news. It's a glad story. It's a glad story and good news that comes from heaven that God has given. So the core message of belief, that believers share is, first of all, Jesus is God in the flesh who comes to earth to redeem humanity. That's what it's all about. Amen. That's what it's about. I told y'all, I'm not going to go through that long dissertation and all of this stuff, but I told y'all the other day when I was dealing with the Jehovah Witness, my message to them was, Jesus is God in the flesh. John 1 and 1. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is God. Oh no, he's not God. He is God. That's the core message. It begins with that. That Jesus is God in the flesh. God came down in the person of Jesus Christ to be with you and I, to share in the human predicament and to experience life like you and I experience it so that he can be our high priest representing us before the Father. That's the gospel. Jesus. That's why he began. He came, all men come into the world to live. Jesus came into the world to die. He's the only man who came into the world to die. He came into the world to die. He came in the body of flesh, humanity, so that he could die. Spirit can't die. So if he's going to die, he has to come like you and I, in the flesh. He was in the flesh. You understand that? Flesh. Say flesh, baby. Flesh. Okay, you understand that. He's in the flesh. But he had a white dick. He had a human nature, but he didn't share in the sinfulness of human nature. He had a human nature, but there was no sin in his human nature. In nature, You and I, there is sin in our nature. That sin is a principle, a principle that is in our nature, and it manifests itself in different ways. Drunkenness, sexual immorality, uh, promiscuity, uh, 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 lying, cussing, and hatred, matter. It's, it manifests itself. It's a principle enough, and it manifests itself according to our different personalities and our different propensities and what we are more vulnerable to. Nobody can put no money in front of me. That, the devil will never, never tempt me with money because no way. I, I, money ain't my thing. And escape money, I steal money, that's not my thing. But the devil knows what my thing may be, so he's going to put that. But you might put money in somebody else because they can't stand to see a dollar on the table. <laughs> so he will tilt you according to your condition and according to your individual propensity. Yes. Vulnerability, what you're more vulnerable to. Amen. Yep. Got it? Okay, yeah. Um, in line with, I'm hearing you say, but back then it would have been like the Jews was looking for this Messiah. 
so the good news when they first heard it would be it would have been more like the Messiah that the prophet spoke of. This is him. When they first started sharing it, something like that. And that was one aspect of one or three aspects. That's so true. Yeah, you see, right. The time was right for Jesus to come into the world. They had what was known as the Pax Romana, which was the Roman peace. Rome had conquered the world, Rome had peace, and so they're not in his peaceful. Now Christ can come. If I, at a time when he didn't have to worry about fighting all over everything, uh, insurrection, it was relative calm. So that, that was in place. Also, uh, he came because uh, at the time, that was Jewish synagogue. Wherever Jews are made up of 50 or more Jews, they had to build a synagogue. And so then, as the Jews were scattered about throughout Asia Minor, which is now Turkey, uh, uh, the Jews built uh, uh, sanctuary. Sanctuary. They built sanctuary. Again, if there were 50 or more Jews, that would, they had to build a sanctuary so they can what? So they can worship. And so then they had the pastoral manner, Roman peace, they had the sanctuary, and also the third thing was that uh, 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 Greek culture dominated the world. Why right? did Rome conquer Greece? But Greek culture was dominant. So that even though Rome culture captured, conquered Greek, Yet, Greek culture prevailed. Rome took on the Greek culture. Uh, so y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And so then, at that time, you had the Roman peace, you had sanctuaries all over, so it made it uh, easy for Christians as they went all over the world. Christians went all over the world, and they went into a temple, in the synagogue, and they began to preach Jesus. So the synagogue would turn into a temple, so to speak. And then you had the Greek culture, so everybody was speaking uh, 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 Hellenistic Greek, which is the Greek of the common people. So you had people, everybody was preaching. They didn't have to worry about preaching and, and speaking. They did on their Pentecost, but they didn't have to worry about speaking in all these different types of language because the Greek culture was dominant and it was full Greek. And so that, so that was those three things. One other thing that you did mention. Those were three things that existed that made it the preaching of the gospel or the spread of the gospel uh, relatively. Uh, so, so to speak, easy. Uh, that, that was it, when time was fully come. And you got to understand that God that doesn't do things. He has a time that that, that time. He, he had a time set to do things. Timely manner, but also a, 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 a time in terms of when he's going to do it. And so then, now, if I were preaching it, I would encourage you to, to uh, don't get excited and don't panic because it hasn't happened for you yet. God got a certain time. All you have to do is hold on and trust and believe and hang in. He got a certain time for it to happen. So then, she did uh, the core message, for the core message was Jesus is God in the flesh who comes to earth to redeem humanity. He came down to redeem humanity. I came that I might give my life as a ransom. I came to redeem the one. I came to die, not to live. And of the miracles he performed, they were only incidental to his man's purpose for coming. He came to go to Calvary. And on his way to Calvary, he would heal the sick, raise the dead, to take fishes and two fishes, five and four. Okay. Yeah, I understand what you said. Yeah, yeah. The gypsy, uh, David was a king and a prophet, but he wasn't a priest. Mm -hmm. Now, Tessadek is a priest, a king, but he's not a prophet. So the three offices <coughs> is found in Jesus. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. So you had some that were priests, but they weren't, and king, but they weren't prophets. They were prophet and king, but not priest. But Jesus, Then when he comes back again, he's going to function as a king. 
Yeah, well, that's, 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 that's great. And, and in eternity, we're going to see him as all three. Yeah, that, 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 that's so true. So right. So that Jesus is God in the flesh who comes to earth to redeem humanity. He went about God, the part of the message was there. He went about doing good and performing miracles. He went about doing good and performing miracles. Now, the miracles, you heard me say part of it in the sermon two weeks ago, miracles that Jesus used. John talks about the miracle. John uses the word uh, uh, for miracle that's translated miracle. That word means sign. So actually they would say, and Jesus performed many signs. Not just Jesus performed many miracles. He didn't perform miracles to display power. Right? You understand me? He just didn't go right. I got power to uh, calm the stone. I can't try to get up and calm the stone and blow them out. He didn't perform miracles just to display or uh, to display his power. They mer those miracles were signs. Signs. You heard me say that. When you look at the first miracle at Cana, he turned water into wine. And the, watch, watch this, watch this. The Bible says that there was six water pots. Six is the number of imperfection. Six is the number of man. So there were six water pots. And Jesus told them pour out. And when he poured the water, it turned into wine. And so what, that, that was a sign. The sign said out of man's imperfection, God pours in his perfect grace. That was a sign. That was a sign. And so then when he got up on the ship, deck on the ship, and said, peace be still, and that was a great calm, it was a sign pointing to the fact that Jesus had power over nature. When he raised Lazarus, that was a sign showing that he had power over death. When he healed the sick, it showed that he had power over diseases. So everything was just power, because that was, there was a sign pointing to something uh, about Jesus' nature. Am I coming through to you? Yeah. So, so, so he went about doing good and performing signs. He was crucified according to God's plan. No man takes my life. I got power to lay it down. I got power to pick it up. So Jesus, all oh, this like this. All men die. And Jesus is the only one who had a dying experience. He, he died, but that was experienced in death. For him. You follow? No man can I pick my life up. I lay it down. I, I, I do whatever I want with this life. And so in three days afterward, you're going to see the Son of Man. What I said to you now, you don't understand, but later you will understand. And then when you see the Son of Man coming in the cloud, you don't even understand. You got to look closely in the scripture. You got to follow men who've been learning in the scripture. And so then, in the fourth chapter of Luke, and not around the 19th verse, and it says, when Jesus went into the temple, he sat down. That was the, the manner in which the rabbis taught. He sat down, and that was given to him the book. And he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to deliver unto God, and to bring glad tidings. But when you read it in Isaiah, you're going to see that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and anointed me to preach the gospel, just like Jesus said. And anointed me to preach the gospel. To bring healing to the broken heart. You're going to see it just like that. But when you read it with Jesus said, you're going to see Jesus left something out. Because in Isaiah, he said, and he was a power of vengeance. Jesus didn't quote that. Why? Because his first coming was to heal a broken heart. His first coming was to bring salvation to the Lord. He didn't quote the second part because that's going to take place when he comes back the second time. Yeah. And so this is 700 years that Isaiah right before Jesus comes. 700 some years. So, he sent, sent me to heal the broken hearted, to preach deliverance, the yeah, to the captain, recovering of sight to the blind, to say that he was here. Right. So then he was crucified according to God's plan. And then the Bible said when they went to arrest Jesus, went to capture Jesus, in some cases they said uh, and they could not because his time was not yet come. He had a special time to come into the way, a special time to die. No man could hijack his heart, no man could assassinate him, no matter could, no man could hide in the jungles and wait for him. He wasn't going nowhere until 
the appointed time. Amen. And so then after we see him tabernacle for about three years, performing miracles, doing all his teaching and whatever, then you get to the 17th chapter of John, you hear him saying, Father, the hour has come. <laughs> I'm in control. The hour has come. Glorify thy son, that your the son may glorify thee. The hour has come to glorify. Well, how do you want to glorify the Father? Through my death. How do we glorify God? Through our death? No, by our living. Right. Present your body a living sacrifice. Yeah. You glorify God when you live the way he wants you to live. When you live under his influence. When you live under his power. When you live an unselfish life. When you live a, a humble, uh, committed, dedicated life. That's how you glorify God. Not taking matters into your own hands. Not getting fed up with what all they have done to you. You glorify God by being cool, calm, and collected, serene in times of trouble, in times of war, in times of hurt and pain and discipline. By holding your peace and saying, you know what? God's going to fight the battle. But then in the back of your mind, you don't have God fighting your battle as a, a desire that God would blast your enemies and, and take care of them folks who are doing you wrong. You want to see them help. You want to see them saved. You want to see them change. That's when you have the spirit of Christ. For love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Okay, so he was raised, he was crucified according to God's plan. He was raised and exalted according to God's plan too. He was raised and exalted to heaven. That's the core of their message. They preached that Jesus came, uh, is God in the flesh. They preached that he went about doing good and performing signs, miracles. He preached, they preached that he was crucified according to God's plan and he was raised and exalted to heaven. He will return in judgment. That's another thing they preached. That, that, that same Jesus whom you are gazing up at, that same Jesus is coming back again. And so what should be the conclusion of all of this? What should all this mean? What should it elicit? From the children of men, the sons of Adam, people should repent and believe and be baptized. Yes. We got this thing kind of wrong. Amen. We think that people should go to school, make money, and, and build big houses, and build, nothing wrong with that. But if that what we include and stop there, then we have missed the whole point. Yes. That's not what we are not on, the, on earth. God did not place us on planet earth to suck up all the resources and to accomplish the thing that the world considers to be important. Because what is your life? Your life is like a vapor. This appears for a little while. Think about it. That's what all of us in here can look back and see when we were 20 years old. That's just when yesterday we were all 20 years old. Right? 20 years old yesterday. John. I mean, I mean you, 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 can, you, can, you can pop from late eight to late. You didn't get tired. Huh? And whenever you fell asleep and somebody shake you up, the first thing you know, what a boy had. You know, remember? Huh? I tell them all the time, the teacher said, when I was back then doing those days, I, I used to go to bed every other night. Now I get up every other day. <laughs> yeah. They ain't changed. They ain't changed. You know? By the time you get ready, by the time you get a hold of this thing and realize what life really is all about, it's almost time to check out. Yeah. Huh? And when you find out how, how it is, what it's all about, you got so many aches and pains, you can't even enjoy half of what you're thinking about. Yeah, that's the only thing from the chair, you see. Because when you know that thing that changed when your back goes out more than you. You know, I'm gonna say one more. You know that the chair, when when Dixie Farmer said have to call the youth and tell them that they need to fill up the scripture and they out of it, but they know you got something left. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> he will return in judgment. Therefore, people should should get ready for that big day. But that great day, that's what it's all about, y'all. 
what they're doing to me, what they said about me. That's not important, baby. All that to vanish away. But that's one of the one thing that left. Only thing you're gonna bring into each other is your personality. Not what you had, but who you were. What did you do with the time, God? Did you evangelize? Did you share the gospel? Did you visit? Did you help? Did you, you, you encourage somebody? Did you lend a helping hand? Did you provide a shoulder for somebody to cry on or lean on? That's the only thing that matters. How many people have you helped? Yeah. Right. I'm not talking about after you have taken care of all of your, your own, uh, you might say, financial investment and stuff that I got $25 left. I think I'll give away $5. I think you've done something. You haven't done anything. <laughs> What, 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 listen, listen. The value of a thing is determined by the sacrifice it takes to do it. The cost. What did it cost me? Okay. So then, he will return to the, That's the core message. So what, what, what are we supposed to be sharing? We're supposed to be sharing this God, this message, that God, Jesus is God who came in the flesh to die for the sins of the world. Yeah? And listen, listen to me, our lost person. Uh, he established himself as one who had divine power by performing miracles. Uh, he was crucified, but he was put to death, not for doing wrong. He was put to death for doing right. And he was put to death for you and for me. He took our place. He died for us. His death had miracles. I told you in the message Sunday that Jesus died. That's the event in history. Jesus died. It's no different than Protagoras died. Heraclitus died. Socrates died. Jesus died for sin. That's the difference. That's the gospel. He died for sin. Not just he died. A lot of folk died. He died for sin, which meant that he died a substitutionary death. He was the substitute. God gave him as a substitute for you and I. You and I should be eternally banished from God. But because we owe God a price that we cannot pay. How are we going to get right with God when we have sinned and we can offer no sacrifice for sin? God said, I'm going to provide you with a sacrifice. I'm going to give my son. And he's going to be a sacrifice for your sin. He died a substitution every day. I'm going to heaven, y'all. But I'm going to heaven because he paid the price for my sins with his death. He died a substitution every day. He died, his death was an atonement that he atoned for sin. His death brought about reconciliation. His death brought about justification. His death made it possible for us to enter into the presence of God and enter into the family of God. His death enabled us to say that we have an inheritance, as Peter said, laid up in heaven. Well, no more. Mark, corrupt, no thief can break in. You follow? Now somebody want all of their inheritance down here. But you don't get all of it down here. Peter said it's laid up. Huh? And so then when we when we all get to it, what a day of rejoicing that'll be. When we all see Jesus. We're gonna inherit his presence. We're gonna be like him. Your worst, listen, your best day here on earth cannot even be compared with one second in heaven. You, you can't be, you can imagine the bliss. You can't imagine the joy. Free of all that makes life sometimes uh, crushing. All that will be done away. Done to the form of things will be done away. And look what he said, I see this, I saw that, I saw this, I saw that, and he said, that one no more see. 
the sea to the Jews, the sea, and even in Africa right now, the sea was a dangerous thing. It was the worst thing that could happen to a person if they died in the sea. That's why Jesus said, woe be unto you who, uh, uh, what, is, what is, woe be unto you who offend one of these little ones. It was better for you that a millstone be hung around your neck and you drown in the depth of the sea. Woo! Because the drowning, drowning was the worst thing, even in Africa, certain parts right now. If you, a person is drowning, nobody would try to help him because they said that God died. And that's why John said that was no more sea. See, represent trouble. He said that all the troubles and all that makes for human hurt and pain. All that can be done. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, my question was, you talked about like Socrates and all the other people that died and how Jesus is the only one that actually died for sin. Mm -hmm. um, would that be, would, would differentiate him from like the History Channel and a lot of other people will say, well, there are other religions and they have a figure just like Christ, you know, who mm -hmm. lived at the same time, died. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, of course. And so would you say that that would be, um, what could be the difference? Okay, the thing that distinguishes Christianity from all the other religions is that our founder got up. Yes. None of them make the claim. Not mm -hmm. none. No other world religion. None make the claim that they found a God up. The founder didn't make the claim. The thing that distinguishes uh, Christianity from Buddhism, Islam, uh, 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 Confucianism, and all of this stuff, the thing that makes Christianity different is that our founder, God, he is alive. That founder is dead. Our founder is alive. That's what it is. And somebody said, well, that's what your Christians believe. But you got a whole lot of them. You got a whole lot of them. You got a whole lot of them. You got a whole lot of folks who saying, well, I don't believe that. One of them saying that Christianity borrowed this message from math, math, mathism or so, or whatever. But, but that's not so because of the fact that none of the founders of other religions ever did say that they would get up or anything of that nature. And their followers didn't claim that he got up. But we know Jesus got up. But Jesus was seen by the apostles. He was seen by, Paul said, over 500 brethren, of which the man, the, the many of them, are a man until his day was spent. While he was wrote, while he wrote for his Corinthians, many of the first century Christians, they were still alive. And so then, notice this, not only that, notice this, that all the things that the Roman government and the Jewish religious leaders, all the accusations they brought against the Christians, not one you will ever find, brought the accusation that he's not alive. <coughs> not one of them brought the accusation that he's not Now, if, if, uh, if, uh, why did the, the Roman soldiers were at the tomb, and then when they found out Jesus was gone, the high priest in them called and said, look, look, we know that if you were sleeping on the tomb, at the tomb, and on God, they're going to kill you. But we're going to tell the, uh, the, the emperor that you all were asleep. Now, first of all, if they were asleep, they're going to be put to death. Secondly, if they were asleep, I didn't even have a dead body. You see how all that breaks down? None of them ever said, he's not alive. They didn't bring that out. You see, because Jesus is alive. Okay, I'm sorry. That's all right. When, 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 when John the Baptist mentioned to the followers that there's someone else that's coming after me who is greater than, than I am and will do more which I understand he was referring to Jesus Christ, am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, when he said that to the people, how, how long did John the Baptist uh, kept preaching and 
exactly how long, whatever, but we do know it was within a six month period because Jesus was, John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. Okay. And so then uh, a Jewish prophet did not go on, on public. Jewish prophets did not enter into public ministry until they were 30 years old. So we know John was 30 years old. And then John was, was killed. And then Jesus came on the scene not being 30 years old. So it had to be within a, a six month period. Yeah. Uh, Rev, my question is to you. Um, you've been talking about evangelizing. And if you're out evangelizing, what would you suggest to the people who are evangelizing and you have to to come across someone or in a group that is demonic, uh, under demonic influence, how should we as believers handle that? Oh, okay, first of all, first, first of all, we would have to, we have to be careful about labor. Because somebody said, well, the demonic influence, how do we know that? Because they act strange, because they wouldn't follow, they might have mental illness. And there are those who have mental, those who are demonically influenced, they uh, are given uh, uh, psychiatric names or so, schizophrenia, neurotic, psychotic, and all of this stuff, and some of these are, 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 are demonic. Clay Trump was a demonologist. He had a team. He went around casting out demons. They went all in Africa. Clay Trump went to 118 countries. And his ministry lasted for 30 years. And that's what they did all the time. They saw all kinds of things. And yet, Craig Cox said, some of those cases were so intricate, so complex, that they had to call in a Christian psychiatrist to determine as best whether this was demonic or mental. Yeah, so, but the point is, so what do we do? The point is, you share, you talk, and you share the gospel. And when it's obvious that the person is vindictive, not vindictive, that the person a group is a hostile, you just break your, you, you break your conversation off and you move on. You're not there to fight, you're not there to persuade. Jesus said to his disciples when they were going out, he said, you go up and whoever receives you into their house, they said, let your peace abide there. But if they reject you, he said, leave, shake off the dust. That was symbolic of rejecting that particular house. So we have to uh, 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 be led by the spirit. And when you come to a situation that is so intricate and, and, and a hot, a volatile, uh, uh, contentious, then you, you, you know, well, I don't want that guy get an argument. You don't get an argument. That's not for you to do. You just move on to the next place. Move on to the next. You don't, you don't argue. The problem, somebody said, when you find two people talking about the Bible, chances are not one of them know it. <laughs> and that's the case. Why talking about something you already know? Huh? You tell somebody, I live in Grammys here. Uh, you don't live in Grammys here, you live in Reserve. Don't tell me I live in Grammys. I live in, well, if you know you live in the country, why are you going through all of that? They, they're not crazy. Uh -huh. that you can you can you can Google him, you can go live with it, and you can read his book. Pastor. But anyway, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, who was the founder of the Catholic religion? Who was the founder of yeah. the Catholic religion? Uh, it was Constantine. I'm thinking it's Constantine. I'm not really really sure. I'm thinking, I'm thinking one by Constantine maybe. Christianity is legal in the Roman. It's a Roman emperor who made religion legal there. But uh, whether he's the founder of religion, he made religion legal because you know they were persecuting, and Constantine made religion legal. So he served a good purpose. By making it legal in, in uh, 300 AD, by making it legal, it, it, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it prevented, you might say, uh, persecution. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to confirm that because I do some um, research on that. Yes, there was Emperor Constantine who uh, made the church part of the uh, who brought the religion. Mm -hmm. You know, that was um, spread across by Peter, mostly than Paul. Mm -hmm. And he made it a, uh, after the conversation, he made it a statewide religion. Right, okay.
Okay, okay, well, good. I wasn't quite sure, but I knew Constantine was very instrumental in, uh, in the uh, Coptic religion. You ever heard of Coptic religion? In Egypt. And it's very like Peter. Uh, a monk. So it, it, it's just um, Mm -hmm. uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, Christ was crucified and he was raised and exhausted into heaven, mm -hmm. something crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. Christ was 100% man mm -hmm. and 100% God. Mm -hmm. He gained his humanity through the birth, mm -hmm. to human birth. Mm -hmm. Now, when did he lose that humanity? Was it at his death? Uh, was it at after his resurrection, you know, because after his resurrection, many saw him, mm -hmm. and they can't see his spirit. Mm -hmm. So many saw him, and plus a, 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 a Thomas put his hand mm -hmm. in the wound in his hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, a stranger brother in the wound in his hand. Mm -hmm. So the question was popping up in my mind, kept popping up in my mind. Well, when did he lose his humanity? Because flesh and blood cannot enter into heaven. Right, right, right. Okay. So mm -hmm. when did he lose his humanity? He didn't lose. We're going to see Christ in heaven, yeah. in his humanity. But it's glorified humanity. Yeah. It's, the, it's the humanity that we are going to share in. What Paul was talking about in Corinthians, and this mortality shall put on immortality. This corruption shall put on incorruption. So that's a body. He goes, before he said all of that, he talked about, uh, because the Corinthian Christian, the, the people in Corinth was uh, vexed. Because there were those who were saying, there's no way possible that God is going to raise a body. And so Paul wrote in that 15th chapter to, 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 to solidify the fact that God will raise the body. But he said, you got to understand this. He said, that which is raised is not the same as that which is sown. In other words, if you plant a corn seed, when it come up, it's not going to come up as a corn seed. It's going to come up like a hop or Or if you rip, uh, put a seed in a mustard seed, it's going to come up different. And so what Paul was saying in Corinth is that uh, there is a body celestial and a body terrestrial. Terrestrial means of the earth. There's a body that is of the earth. Celestial means there's a body that is of the spirit of heaven. And so what he's saying, this the rest of the body is going to be placed in the ground. But when they come up, it's going to come up a body with all its features, but it's going to be a terrestrial, a celestial body. It's going to look the same, but it will be different material. Y'all don't hear what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's what, you, and that's what, that's what Paul was talking about. What, what I preach about at the funeral, sadly, that, uh, that, that uh, the, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of our opinion, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, when he come back, Christ comes back, he's going to bring the spirit of all those who have died in him. And they, they're going to come, and he place the spirit back in the body. But when that body gets up to some long, it won't be like the body that we have here. It's going to be a body with features, but it's going to be of a different material. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We tell them that that body is not going to have flesh and blood. So when you look at Jesus, you, if Jesus said to Thomas, feel me, touch me. For no, that a, a, a spirit does not have flesh and bone. He ain't said nothing but blood. Because it doesn't have nothing. Y'all got it? Okay, y'all like some stuff tonight. Huh? That's what, but that's where the joy, that's where the comfort comes in there. That's where... The, uh, uh, holding on coming. You don't, you, you, don't, you don't depend on how good the service was. And say that how well the preacher for you and I didn't feel nothing too much. Your shout, you remember we talked about shout Sunday? Your shout got to be based on the word of God. Your shout can't be based on how you feel, how things look. Your shout can't be based on none of that. Your shout got to be based on what God said. You don't take your clue. You don't draw your conclusion from how they look. You draw your conclusion from what he said. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. All things are working to good. You are more than comfortable. I have given you the victory. Trust me. Be courageous. Don't fear. 
Well, I'll be with you. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. You got to, you with me. I don't feel it like you're with me. I, I don't smell you. I don't taste you. But, but, but regardless of all of that, you're with me. Why? Because he said he's going to be with me. You don't hear what I'm saying? That's why I preach. That's why I pastor. That's how I pastor. And I was like, please this one, please that one. And I said, that. no, no, no. I passed it by trusting and leaning and depending on him. That he is going to give me what I need. And even when I'm slipping a little bit, he loves me and he knows my heart. He'll bring me back into the past. I preach to you about the forgiveness of God. Well, that goes for me too. Now, the trouble with y'all, y'all think that y'all got forgiveness for the past alone. He had a, like this, he had a, he had a human body, but he didn't have a human nature. Right. Human nature is sick. He had a human body. Right. And he could feel, he could hurt, he could cry, he wept at the grave of life. He, 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 he could cry, he stood the last two days of his life, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killed the prophet and stoned them that are sent unto thee. How often would I gather together as a hen gather her chicks? But you would not. Now your house is left desolate. He cried, he hurt, because the people he came to see, they didn't, and he said, this is what he said. He said, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You missed it. I come to save you. I came to save you. I came to liberate you. I know you wanted me to liberate you from the Roman power and the Roman government, but I came to liberate you from a greater enemy. I came to liberate you from sin. I came to set you free. Not that you might do what you want to do, but free that you might serve God the way he wants you to serve. To break the power of sin in your life. That's the gospel. That's what you want to tell for. And when you look at them and you see them and then your family and wherever they are, don't, don't, don't just beat up on them. You know, I don't understand. I ain't going to get so broke. I just Lord, I ain't no good. But Christ came to save folks. And, 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 and uh, the, the, it's not for you to try and evaluate every situation. It is for you, the priest of God. Now if somebody, I don't care how low you are, I don't care how no good you are, I don't care how lost you are. There is somebody. If you're willing to turn to him, he'll turn to you. Yes, Lord. And he can save you. And he can start you on a long journey back home. Oh, thank you, God. That's what you got to tell them. You're not doing them any good by reminding them of how much they drink. They know more than you. They've been drinking since 5 this morning. You only saw them at 10. <laughs> you say, you've been drinking since 10 o'clock. No, you're lying. I've been drinking since 10. I've been drinking since 2. <laughs> you don't have nobody like that. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Our witness must be both objective and subjective. What we say and what we show must go hand in hand. That cannot be a gap between the deed and the creed. Hmm? You got to talk the talk. You got to walk the walk. Yo, yo, listen to me. Listen. Understand this. Your life, your Consistent behavior. You in your normal uh, 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 self from day to day, hour to hour, from morning to morning. Your life will make your testimony believable or unbelievable. Your life, your way, how you, your attitude, the way you treat people, your attitude about them, the way you handle situations will make when they, what they see in you. And what they see you do will determine whether or not they believe what you say. So I love you, Sister Barbara. I mean, I love you. I love you so much. You just don't. But I love you, darling. <laughs> right, that's right. It's going to be hard for me 
to get sent to Barbara to believe, to believe that I love her and I keep hurting her. Huh? Every time she go wherever she had to go, somebody will tell you, you know one thing? Reverend Gansey gets so sick and tired of you, Bob, them call me that thing. It could be hard for her to believe that I love her and I want to be that friend. and I appreciate her coming to me or whatever it is if all she hear is that I'm complaining about you. And so then, now, look, look what he said there. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. It doesn't mean that they dropped out of his son. Unlearned and ignorant does not mean that they were kicked out of the kettlebell. It simply means they did not have the former training that other Jew rabbis had. You follow? And so that when they realized that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Oh, if I was preaching to Sister Lynn, I'd write back and say, can folks tell whether or not you've been with Jesus? <laughs> that, that's the question. The question is, can people tell that you have been with Jesus? Can they tell by the way you walk? Can they tell by the way you talk? Can you tell that you, they tell by the way you treat your friends? But can they tell by the way you treat those who don't? Like you, can they tell that you've been with Jesus by your conversation? Am I helping somebody? And then I would go a little further and say, Why can your husband tell that you've been with Jesus? Oh Lord, husband, can you one tell that you've been with Jesus? Oh Lord. And so, 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 so they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And anybody brought know who's been with Jesus, they know how to love. They know how to treat folks the way they want to be treated. If you have you've been with Jesus, you can hold no grudge for two and three months. And you've been with Jesus. Yeah. And it's hard for some folks to really believe that certain people can love them. Because they've been abused, they've been talked of, they've been, they've been put down, and, and, and they've been compared to their sister who, who's on the honor roll. Or they, your father? These kind of things. And, and sometimes parents think that they're motivating the child to do better by comparing them with their other child. So, but that's not the, that's not the case. And, and so then, huh? We all different, and we have to recognize that difference does not mean that they are of different value. The difference is in might be in the intellect, the difference may be in the energy, but the difference is not in their uh, intrinsic value. They are still important. They still work, of, you know, and that's the whole value and things like that. So we got to look. When Michelangelo was at the rock once and, and he just was chipping away, chipping away. Somebody walked up there and saw that big rock and he asked Michelangelo, the great sculptor, he said, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to release the angel that is in this rock. And when you look at it first, I know, I know they're bad, I know they're all of this, but just let's assume at least a limit. That there is an angel behind all of that badness, behind all that ugliness, behind all that selfishness. That just might be an angel. And you might can help release that angel by showing patience, by love, by, by trying to give some direction, uh -huh, by taking some time, by praying for them. You understand, Mr. Jackie? Yeah, yeah, you, you've been with them children and all that stuff. And so then, you, you, we, 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 we got to try, and help. that's what I try to do, y'all. I look at y'all. I look at y'all and I say, 
on the love. And, 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 and I get up and I use the, what do you call it? I speak, I speak scripture. And I said, well, I said, Lord, you, you, he said, just chip away. <laughs> chip away, there's an angel behind you. Huh? Yeah, the, the Lord said, chip away, there's an angel. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. <laughs> y'all understand? Y'all understand? That's my message to y'all. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God bless you all tonight. And the Lord keep you happy. Have, have you been blessed tonight? Yes. That word is a blessing, isn't it? The Bible says he sent his word and healed him. That word is a healing word. That word enlightens. You dispel darkness, ignorance. Enable, enable you to see the glory of God. The goodness of God. And able to see the possibilities of yourself. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. We're, we're bought in. We're bought in too deeply. We're bought too deeply into what other folk might think and would think. We, 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 we have determined that this, according to this Western civilization, this American culture, we have determined that this is to constitute success. This constitutes success. And we try to live up to to this false uh, value system. No. No. To know Jesus, to know God, is where His purpose for you. To live to your highest level. That's success. To be real, to be genuine, to be true, and to give it your best. That's success. Don't measure yourself by somebody else, and don't look to other people to validate your existence. You are already on. If certain people, if certain group, if I had certain stuff, then I'd be known. That won't make you all right. But knowing God, you're the people. Helping somebody to say, Glory,
and that your grace is sufficient to handle any situation that comes into that. Thank you, Lord. Make us use of God and direct us in a way of a life. Give us safe return.